Chapter 23, Diet and Health. Our bodies are built up from the food we eat. There's a constant breaking down of the tissues of the body. Every movement of every organ involves waste, and this waste is repaired from our food. Each organ of the body requires its share of nutrition. The brain must be supplied with its portion. The bones, muscles, and nerves demand theirs. It is a wonderful process that transforms the food into blood and uses this blood to build up the varied parts of the body. But this process is going on continually, supplying with life and strength each nerve, muscle, and tissue. Selection of food. Those foods should be chosen that best supply the elements needed for building up of the body. In this choice, appetite is not a safe guide. Through wrong habits of eating, the appetite has become perverted. Often it demands food that impairs health and causes weakness instead of strength. We cannot safely be guided by the customs of society. The disease and suffering that everywhere prevail are largely due to popular errors in regard to diet. In order to know what are the best foods, we must study God's original plan for man's diet. He who created man and who understands his needs appointed Adam his food. Behold, he said, I have given you every herb yielding seed, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis 1, 29, American Revised Version. Upon leaving Eden to gain his livelihood by tilling the earth under the curse of sin, man received permission to eat also the herb of the field. Genesis 3.18. Grains, fruits, nuts, and vegetables constitute the diet chosen for us by our Creator. These foods, prepared in as simple and natural a manner as possible, are the most healthful and nourishing. They impart a strength, power of endurance, a vigor of intellect, that are not afforded by a more complex and stimulating diet. But not all foods wholesome in themselves are equally suited to our needs under all circumstances. Care should be taken in the selection of food. Our diet should be suited to the season, to the climate in which we live, and to the occupation we follow. Some foods that are adapted for use at one season or in one climate are not suited to another. So there are different foods best suited for persons in different occupations. Often food that can be used with benefit by those engaged in hard physical labor is unsuitable for persons of sedentary pursuits or intense mental application. God has given us an ample variety of healthful foods, and each person should choose from it the things that experience and sound judgment prove to be best suited to his own necessities. Nature's abundant supply of fruits, nuts, and grains is ample, and year by year the products of all lands are more generally distributed to all by the increased facilities for transportation. As a result, many articles of food, which a few years ago were regarded as expensive luxuries, are now within the reach of all as foods for everyday use. This is especially the case with dried and canned fruits. Nuts and nut foods are coming largely into use to take the place of flesh meats. With nuts may be combined grains, fruits, and some roots to make foods that are healthful and nourishing. Care should be taken, however, not to use too large a proportion of nuts. Those who realize ill effects from the use of nut foods may find the difficulty removed by attending to this precaution. Should be remembered, too, that some nuts are not so wholesome as others. Almonds are preferable to peanuts. But peanuts in limited quantities used in connection with grains are nourishing and digestible. When properly prepared, olives, like nuts, supply the place of butter and flesh meats. The oil as eaten in the olive is far preferable to animal oil or fat. It serves as a laxative. Its use will be found beneficial to consumptives, and it is healing to an inflamed, irritated stomach. Persons who have accustomed themselves to a rich, highly stimulating diet have an unnatural taste, and they cannot at once relish food that is plain and simple. It will take time for the taste to become natural and for the stomach to recover from the abuse it has suffered. But those who persevere in the use of wholesome food will after a time find it palatable. Its delicate and delicious flavors will be appreciated. 
and it will be eaten with greater enjoyment than can be derived from unwholesome dainties. And the stomach, in a healthy condition, neither fevered nor overtaxed, can readily perform its task. In order to maintain health, a sufficient supply of good, nourishing food is needed. If we plan wisely, that which is most conducive to health can be secured in almost every land. The various preparations of rice, wheat, corn, and oats are sent abroad everywhere, also beans, peas, and lentils. These, with native or imported fruits, and the variety of vegetables that grow in each locality, give an opportunity to select a dietary that is complete without the use of flesh meats. Wherever fruit can be grown in abundance, a liberal supply should be prepared for winter by canning or drying. Small fruits such as currants, gooseberries, strawberries, raspberries, and blackberries can be grown to advantage in many places where they are but little used and their cultivation is neglected. For household canning, glass rather than tin cans should be used whenever possible. It is especially necessary that the fruit for canning should be in good condition. Use little sugar and cook the fruit only long enough to ensure its preservation. Thus prepared, it is an excellent substitute for fresh fruit. Wherever dried fruits such as raisins, prunes, apples, pears, peaches, and apricots are obtainable at moderate prices, it will be found that they can be used as staple articles of diet much more freely than is customary, with the best results to the health and vigor all classes of workers. There should not be a great variety at any one meal, for this encourages overeating and causes indigestion. It is not well to eat fruit and vegetables at the same meal. If the digestion is feeble, the use of both will often cause distress and inability to put forth mental effort. It is better to have the fruit at one meal and the vegetables at another. The meal should be varied. Same dishes prepared in the same way should not appear on the table meal after meal, day after day. The meals are eaten with greater relish and the system is better nourished when the food is varied. Preparation of food. It is wrong to eat merely to gratify the appetite, but no indifference should be manifested regarding the quality of the food or the manner of its preparation. If the food eaten is not relished, the body will not be so well nourished. The food should be carefully chosen and prepared with intelligence and skill. For use in bread making, the superfine white flour is not the best. Its use is neither healthful nor economical. Fine flour bread is lacking in nutritive elements to be found in bread made from whole wheat. It is a frequent cause of constipation and other unhealthful conditions. The use of soda or baking powder in bread making is harmful and unnecessary. Soda causes inflammation of the stomach and often poisonous the entire system. Many housewives think that they cannot make good bread without soda, but this is an error. If they would take the trouble to learn better methods, their bread would be more wholesome and, to a natural taste, it would be more palatable. In making of raised or yeast bread, milk should not be used in place of water. The use of milk is an additional expense, and it makes the bread much less wholesome. Milk bread does not keep sweet so long after baking as does that made with water, and it ferments more readily in the stomach. Bread should be light and sweet. Not the least taint of sourness should be tolerated. The loaves should be small and so thoroughly baked that so far as possible the yeast germs sh shall be destroyed. When hot or new, raised bread of any kind is difficult of digestion. It should never appear on the table. This rule does not, however, apply to unleavened bread. Fresh rolls made of wheaten meal without yeast or leaven and baked in a well-heated oven are both wholesome and palatable. Grains used for porridge or mush should have several hours cooking, but soft or liquid foods are less wholesome than dry foods which require thorough mastication. Zwiebach, or twice-baked bread, is one of the most easily digested and most palatable of foods. Let ordinary raised bread be cut in slices and dried in a warm oven till the last trace of moisture disappears. Then let it be browned slightly all the way through. In a dry place, this bread can be kept much longer than ordinary bread and if reheated before using, it will be as fresh as when new. 
Far too much sugar is ordinarily used in foods. Cakes, sweet puddings, pastries, jellies, jams are active causes of indigestion. Especially harmful are the custards and puddings in which milk, eggs, and sugar are the chief ingredients. The free use of milk and sugar taken together should be avoided. If milk is used, it should be thoroughly sterilized. With this precaution, there is less danger of contracting disease from its use. Butter is less harmful when eaten on cold bread than when used in cooking. But as a rule, it is better to dispense with it altogether. Cheese is still more objectionable. It is wholly unfit for food. As a footnote on this that I should read from the publishers, the safeguarding of the purity of all foods of dairy origin is a matter of prime importance. While frequent testing of dairy herds together with thorough pasteurization and refrigeration serves to this end, such foods, if from uncertain sources or if carelessly handled, constitute a serious menace to health. For as stated in U.S. Department of Agriculture Farmers Bulletin No. 1705 by a government expert, Rowena Smith Carpenter, quote, the same chemical constituents and physical properties that recommend milk as a human food make it an excellent food for bacteria, unquote. The reader will understand that the reference to cheese does not include cottage cheese or foods of a similar character which were ever recognized by the author as wholesome. Scanty, ill-cooked food depraves the blood by weakening the blood-making organs. It deranges the system and brings on disease with its accompaniment of irritable nerves and bad tempers. The victims of poor cookery are numbered by thousands and tens of thousands. Over many graves might be written, died because of poor cooking, died of an abused stomach. It is a sacred duty for those who cook to learn how to prepare healthful food. Many souls are lost as a result of poor cookery. It takes thought and care to make good bread, but there is more religion in a loaf of good bread than many think. There are few really good cooks. Young women think that it is menial to cook and do other kinds of housework, and for this reason many girls who marry and have the care of families have little idea of the duties devolving upon a wife and mother. Cooking is no mean science, and it is one of the most essential in practical life. It is a science that all women should learn, and it should be taught in a way to benefit the poorer classes. To make food appetizing, at the same time simple and nourishing, requires skill, but it can be done. Cooks should know how to prepare simple food in a simple and healthful manner, and so that it will be found more palatable, as well as more wholesome, because of its simplicity. Every woman who is at the head of a family and yet does not understand the art of healthful cookery should determine to learn that which is so essential to the well-being of her household. In many places, hygienic cooking schools afford opportunity for instruction in this line. She who has not the help of such facilities should put herself under the instruction of some good cook and persevere in her efforts for improvement until she is mistress of the culinary art. Regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal. At this time, let everyone eat what the system requires and then take nothing more until the next meal. There are many who eat when the system requires no food at irregular intervals and between meals because they have not sufficient strength of will to resist the inclination. When traveling, some are constantly nibbling at anything eatable within their reach. This is very injurious. If travelers would eat regularly of food that is simple and nutritious, they would not feel so great weariness, nor suffer so much from sickness. Another pernicious habit is that of eating just before bedtime. The regular meals may have been taken, but because there is a sense of faintness, more food is eaten. By indulgence, this wrong practice becomes a habit and often so firmly fixed that it is thought impossible to sleep without food. As a result of eating late suppers, the digestive process is continued through the sleeping hours. But though the stomach works constantly, its work is not properly accomplished. The sleep is often disturbed with unpleasant dreams. And in the morning, the person awakens unrefreshed and with little relish for breakfast. 
when we lie down to rest, the stomach should have all its work done, that it as well as the other organs of the body may enjoy rest. For persons of sedentary habits, late suppers are particularly harmful. With them, the disturbance created is often the beginning of disease that ends in death. In many cases, the faintness that leads to a desire for food is felt because the digestive organs have been too severely taxed during the day. After deposing of one meal, the digestive organs need rest. At least five or six hours should intervene between meals. And most persons who give the plan a trial will find that two meals a day are better than three. Wrong Conditions of Eating Food should not be eaten very hot or very cold. If food is cold, the vital force of the stomach is drawn upon in order to warm it before digestion can take place. Cold drinks are injurious for the same reason, while the free use of hot drinks is debilitating. In fact, the more liquid there is taken with the meals, the more difficult it is for the food to digest for the liquid must be absorbed before digestion can take place. Do not eat largely of salt. Avoid the use of pickles and spiced foods. Eat an abundance of fruit, and the irritation that calls for so much drink at mealtime will largely disappear. Food should be eaten slowly and should be thoroughly masticated. This is necessary in order that the saliva may be properly mixed with the food and the digestive fluids be called into action. Another serious evil is eating at improper times, as after violent or excessive exercise, when one is much exhausted or heated. Immediately after eating, there is a strong draft upon the nervous energies. And when mind or body is heavily taxed just before or just after eating, digestion is hindered. When one is excited, anxious, or hurried, it is better not to eat until rest or relief is found. The stomach is closely related to the brain, and when the stomach is diseased, the nerve power is called from the brain to the aid of the weakened digestive organs. When these demands are too frequent, the brain becomes congested. And when the brain is constantly taxed, and there is lack of physical exercise, even plain food should be eaten sparingly. At mealtime, cast off care and anxious thought. Do not feel hurried, but eat slowly and with cheerfulness, with your heart filled with gratitude to God for all His blessings. Many who discard flesh meats and other gross and injurious articles think that because their food is simple and wholesome, they may indulge appetite without restraint and they eat to excess, sometimes to gluttony. This is an error. Digestive organs should not be burdened with a quantity or quality of food which it will tax the system to appropriate. Custom has decreed that the food should be placed upon the table in courses. Not knowing what is coming next, one may eat a f sufficiency of food which perhaps is not the best suited to him. When the last course is brought on, he often ventures to overstep the bounds and take the tempting dessert, which, however, proves anything but good for him. If all the food intended for a meal is placed on the table at the beginning, one has opportunity to make the best choice. Sometimes the result of overeating is felt at once. In other cases, there is no sensation of pain, but the digestive organs lose their vital force, and the foundation of physical strength is undermined. The surplus food burdens the system and produces morbid, feverish conditions. It calls an undue amount of blood to the stomach, causing the limbs and extremities to chill quickly. It lays a heavy burden on the digestive organs, and when these organs have accomplished their task, there is a feeling of faintness or languor. Some who are continually overeating call this all-gone feeling hunger, but it is caused by the overworked condition of the digestive organs. At times there is numbness of the brain with disinclination to mental or physical effort. These unpleasant symptoms are felt because nature has accomplished her work at an unnecessary outlay of vital force and is thoroughly exhausted. The stomach is saying, Give me rest. 
but with many the faintness is interpreted as a demand for more food. So instead of giving the stomach rest, another burden is placed upon it. As a consequence, the digestive organs are often worn out when they should be capable of doing good work. We should not provide for the Sabbath a more liberal supply or a greater variety of food than for other days. Instead of this, the food should be more simple and less should be eaten in order that the mind may be clear and vigorous to comprehend spiritual things. A clogged stomach means a clogged brain. The most precious words may be heard and not appreciated because the mind is confused by an improper diet. By overeating on Sabbath, many do more than they think to unfit themselves for receiving the benefit of its sacred opportunities. Cooking on the Sabbath should be avoided, but it is not therefore necessary to eat cold food. In cold weather, the food prepared the day before should be heated, and let the meals, however simple, be palatable and attractive, especially in families where there is children. It is well on the Sabbath to provide something that will be regarded as a treat, something the family do not have every day. Where wrong habits of diet have been indulged, there should be no delay in reform. When dyspepsia has resulted from abuse of the stomach, efforts should be made carefully to preserve the remaining strength of the vital forces by removing every overtaxing burden. The stomach may never entirely recover health, after long abuse, but a proper course of diet will save further debility, and many will recover more or less fully. It is not easy to prescribe rules that will meet every case, but with attention to right principles in eating, great reforms may be made, and the cook need not be continually toiling to tempt the appetite. Abstemiousness in diet is rewarded with mental and moral vigor, it also aids in control of the passions. Overeating is especially harmful to those who are sluggish in temperament. These should eat sparingly and take plenty of physical exercise. There are men and women of excellent natural ability who do not accomplish half what they might if they would exercise self-control in the denial of appetite. Many writers and speakers fail here. After eating heartily, they give themselves to sedentary occupations, reading, study, or writing, allowing no time for physical exercise. As a consequence, the free flow of thought and words is checked. They cannot write or speak with the force and intensity necessary in order to reach the heart. Their efforts are tame and fruitless. Those upon whom rest important responsibilities those above all who are guardians of spiritual interests should be men of keen feeling and quick perception. More than others, they need to be temperate in eating. Rich and luxurious foods should have no place upon their tables. Every day men in positions of trust have decisions to make upon which depend results of great importance. Often they have to think rapidly, and this can be done successfully by those only who practice strict temperance. The mind strengthens under the correct treatment of the physical and mental powers. If the strain is not too great, new vigor comes with every taxation. But often the work of those who have important plans to consider and important decisions to make is affected for evil by the results of improper diet. A disordered stomach produces a disordered, uncertain state of mind. Often it causes irritability, harshness, or injustice. Many a plan that would have been a blessing to the world has been set aside. Many unjust, oppressive, even cruel measures have been carried as a result of diseased conditions due to wrong habits of eating. Here is a suggestion for all whose work is sedentary or chiefly mental. Let those who have sufficient moral courage and self-control try it. At each meal take only two or three kinds of simple food, and eat no more than it is required to satisfy hunger. Take active exercise every day, and see if you do not receive benefit. Strong men who are engaged in active physical labor are not compelled to be as careful 
as to the quantity or quality of their food, as are persons of sedentary habits. But even these would have better health if they would practice self-control in eating and drinking. Some wish that an exact rule could be prescribed for their diet. They overeat and then regret it, and so they keep thinking about what they eat and drink. This is not as it should be. One person cannot lay down an exact rule for another. Everyone should exercise reason and self-control and should act from principle. Our bodies are Christ's purchased possession, and we are not at liberty to do with them as we please. All who understand the laws of health should realize their obligation to obey these laws which God has established in their being. Obedience to the laws of health is to be made a matter of personal duty. We ourselves must suffer the results of violated law. We must individually answer to God for our habits and practices. Therefore the question with us is not, what is the world's practice, but how shall I as an individual treat the habitation that God has given me?